Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Movie Love Podcast. Why Movie Love? Because throughout the series, I'll be inviting podcasters I love to talk about movies they love and suggest a charity in case you want to send your love. My name is Dimitri, film critic online and in print. You can find some of my work at idiomatic.com. And my guest today is Miles Stokes from the wonderful comic book podcast, Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. How are you today, Miles? Hey, Dimitri. I am doing pretty well, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I remember we recorded, I don't even know how many years ago at this point, but I had a great time then, so I'm excited to be recording with you again. I had a great time then as well. It was for Days of Future Past. And I'm also still a fan of Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. And right now you guys are right in the middle of the 90s, which is when I was actually collecting comics. And it's been a trip revisiting these things through your eyes and also through my nostalgic eyes and kind of melding the two together. And it's been like a really great experience doing that this year. Oh, thank you. And I'm, I'm really happy you're still enjoying the show. Um, yeah, the mid 90s are, are such a strange transitional time. I grew up with X-Men in the early 90s. That was what was coming out when I was reading it. And this is actually an era that I'm not all that familiar with, so it's really cool getting to explore it for the first time and to hear the thoughts of people for whom that was their X-Men era. Now, before recording, I asked Miles to pick one of his favorite movies for us to discuss, along with a cool charity he'd like to bring attention to. So, Miles, what charity will you be playing for today? Uh, I wanted to get the word out for a charity that probably a lot of people have already heard of, but I think is very important, and that is called Trans Lifeline. And Trans Lifeline is a nonprofit that helps out trans folks who are in crisis. They have a support hotline that is amazing. They do micro grants to trans folks that could use those. They have other resources available as well. And yeah, I figure I've I've been fortunate enough myself to relatively easily live my life as who I am in a world that is very supportive of that. And so I figure it's really important to support folks whose identities the world isn't always as kind to, and Trans Lifeline is one of the best organizations I know for that, for trans folks in particular. So yeah, if uh, anyone listening to this wants to check them out, see if they can support them if they're able to, I think that would be an admirable and excellent thing to do. It's a beautiful choice, Miles. I'll be sure to check it out. And for anyone interested in doing the same, link in the description below. All right. Listeners, if you've read the episode of the title, you probably already know what movie Miles picked. But uh, just the same, what movie did you pick, Miles? So I picked one of my very favorite movies, which is 1998's Dark City, directed by Alex Proyas. It is a movie that I find myself coming back to again and again. And I'm not a person to rewatch things, mainly because my media bucket list is a million miles long. And so I feel like there's always something new I should be checking out. But I never regret rewatching Dark City. And rewatching it yet again in preparation for recording this, it's always better than I remembered. I'm not saying it's a perfect movie, but I love it so much. Yeah, I had the same experience. Like, I'm a big fan of Dark City as well. I saw it when it came out of theaters, was I think the only person in the theater at the time. Oh, wow. Like, this movie was discovered on video. It didn't do well on its initial theatrical run, but I fell in love instantly with it. But I think it got lost in the shuffle because it was like one of those movies that was advertised as like reality isn't what you think it is. And it was right in the middle of like every movie was about virtual reality at that point. Like you had 13th Floor and eventually Matrix, Existence and all these movies. And it's unfortunate because A, it's not that. It's not a virtual reality movie. And B, it is excellent and i was so happy to revisit it yeah it's it's interesting that you mention the matrix the 13th floor etc one of the articles that's really influenced the way i look at dark city was an article written years ago by a guy named tim peters where he was describing the sort of micro genre that he called conspiracy gothic which included yeah those movies also the truman show all of which came out in 98 and 99 and yeah you're right it's, it's not a movie about virtual reality but it definitely is a movie about the world not being quite what the characters think it is, and them uncovering this larger strangeness to their lives. And I don't know what it was about the late 90s that just made everyone want to look at the world that way, but Dark City is certainly the one that resonated most with me, both aesthetically and thematically. I think one of the peculiarities about it, in terms of looking at it as like the world is not what it is, is most of these movies tend to try to recreate our world and say like, what would it be like if it turns out your world isn't real? And Dark City creates a world that is most definitely other. It has a very impressionistic aesthetic. It seems really, really influenced by uh, Jean-Pierre Jeunet's uh, City of Lost Children, in fact. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things I like about it, is that it's such an appealing 
and yet unsettling setting. Like, the city that's in Dark City, you know, it's set in this very ambiguous time period that's somewhere between the 20s and the 50s, and different elements do or don't line up with each other. And it's almost this Ur city. Like, everywhere the characters go, it's just towering buildings, and businesses, and streets, and streetcars, and traffic, and like, everything is the concept of city. It's as if the, the rest of the aspects of the world that were not city are just not relevant. So before we go any further, I just do want to mention to people that we are going to talk about the movie with spoilers. We are talking about it with the expectation that you've seen it. If you haven't, please stop the podcast. Go check it out. Watch it. It's worth your time. And come back because we are going to spoil the movie. Although it's worth mentioning that the movie spoils itself with its opening line, which is one of the quirks that every time I watch it, I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Of course, there, there's a director's cut as well available of Dark City, which is also very good, and, and I'd say the biggest change is that it removes that opening narration that, from what I understand, at the studio sort of required the director to put in. I, I remember when we were uh, preparing for this episode, you were asking whether I thought we should do the theatrical or the director's cut in our coverage, and like... I'm always so torn, because I love that the director's cut just throws you into the deep end immediately, but the pacing of the theatrical cut is just a thing of perfection, so I tend to lean in that direction. So I have both versions, like uh, any obsessive fan does. <laughs> and I've kind of ended up watching them back to back without meaning to, because I, I have them uploaded on the hard drive, because I've grown too lazy to put things into a disc tray. Physical reality, god yeah, so much work. So when the director's cut played after, I just kept watching. And I yeah, like every shot lasts a few seconds longer than in the theatrical cut. And there is something absolutely engrossing in the way the theatrical cut just like throws you in there and just speeds you through the plot with like these very close shots and quick cuts that almost give it a comic book feel because whenever somebody wants to give a paper, you never see the full gesture. You see their face, it cuts to a close up of a hand, cuts to the envelope and it cuts back to their face. It's kind of like watching a comic book in motion in that sense. Yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about it that way, but you're you're totally right, Dimitri. And, and maybe that's part of why it's, it's so appealing to, you know, us as, as people who also love comics. And yeah, so much of the movie is... Uh, you're really in the head of the protagonist, of of John Murdoch, who, you know, has lost his memory, he doesn't understand what's going on around him, things don't make sense. And so having that relentless, quick-cut pace, being able to follow just how disoriented he is through the visual representation of the story, I think works really well. Like, that, the sort of relentless driving soundtrack, those shortcuts, like... It's never a boring movie, and I feel like in the theatrical cut, with those very quick shots, like, no moment is wasted. And that also, I think, for the, the scenes that do breathe a bit more, really makes them stand out by contrast, which I appreciate. Yeah, I, I actually had that in a note, almost verbatim. Like, it's actually no frame is wasted, is what I wrote, but pretty much the <laughs> same thing. And the casting in this movie is just stellar. All of the main characters, I love the actors and actresses that play them. You know, it's a little bit the Nolan technique in a way, because Christopher Nolan, his movies tend to be not particularly involved with character and much more concerned with plot. Mm -hmm. And he wisely casts these A-list actors who are, you know, inherently soulful to sort of fill the blanks. And Dark City is kind of stuck in the same situation, not because it's not concerned with character, but rather because it tells a story where you have to question the nature of character. And so he can't define them too strongly, and so he relies on these actors to portray the idea that their inherent nature is overcoming the artificial nurture that the strangers impose on them. And yeah, it's, it's all in the hands of the cast to try to do that. And Jennifer Connelly has kind of made a career of being soulful. Mm -hmm. And the same with John Hurt. He's an actor who doesn't do a lot of theatrics, but you get a sense of who he is right away just through subtle inflections, you know? Absolutely. I think you're totally right. And I mean, I think that also is a, is a wise choice given the nature of the plot. You know, like you said, these are characters who have had, and this is the part where we just straight up explicitly spoil the movie, who have had their histories built for them. They have these identities that have been created. And as such, their identities are... I say cliched, but I don't mean that in a bad way because they're supposed to be cliched. These characters are archetypes. Like, John Hurt is the prototypical 
police detective who's obsessed with his work and very lonely even though he'd never admit it and just those subtleties just you know the twitch of an eyebrow or the holding of a blank stare for just a little bit longer convey that so perfectly convey the actual human beings behind these very fake identities i like how consistent the acting is within the movie like for example the one human character that doesn't have that is Kiefer Sutherland. He's a doctor whom the strangers allow to keep his memory so he can help them. And his acting, like his choice of performance are much more mannered. They're much more external. He has this kind of verbal tick where he talks like this all the time. And it's very over the top, but it helps to contrast the difference between a humanity that's seeping through and a humanity that is at home. I think you're totally right, yeah. And man, everyone knows Kiefer Sutherland from like Lost Boys or Flatliners or 24. For me, this is Kiefer Sutherland, so whenever he's not talking like Dr. Schrieber, it just seems weird to me. <laughs> Even Mr. Hand, the actor who plays Mr. Hand, that's Richard O'Brien, he plays a stranger who decides to go through the imprinting process to try to find John Murdoch. When he's imprinted, because the idea, I think, is that the strangers don't have a nature, they're entirely nurture. He becomes exactly what the narrative requires him to be, and he turns into a full-on psychotic serial killer, because that's the imprint that John Murdoch was supposed to have, and he is creepy as fuck. Oh, he's so great in it. He's just got this subtle, like, malicious inhumanity that is, like you said, it's part that serial killer persona that was constructed for John, but it's also part just this alien, externalized nature where you can tell he just has no empathy whatsoever and the idea to get freaking riffraff from rocky horror picture show to play that <laughs> character is brilliant he just owns the role perfectly and there are a lot of strangers you know i think a lot of the strangers do a great job i particularly enjoy mr sleep the child stranger who's just creepy as hell but to put mr hands to put richard o'brien at the forefront of that as the representative of the strangers like in a way, it reminds me of the Chamberlain from The Dark Crystal, another movie with dark in the title that I love. <laughs> you know, he's not necessarily the most normal of the Skeksis from The Dark Crystal, but he's the one that just through his sheer intensity really gets across how weird and malicious they are. I think it's a good bridge to talk a little bit about the strangers. I like them as villains. They're interesting because they are undeniably cruel. Like, you, you meet Dr. Schreiber and you realize just how much they tortured him and perhaps for kicks but there is something valid about their desperation to try to live mm -hmm. and they don't turn on each other so presumably their lack of empathy is not a, a selfishness it's something else i actually kind of feel bad for them even though they're clearly villainous and you know what they did to these humans is inexcusable you kind of get the idea of a creature that like doesn't know any better to a certain degree uh, I agree, yeah, and I think part of that actually ties back to the lack of empathy, is that we can tell they're at least somewhat some sort of a hive mind, even though they do appear to be individuated to an extent in the different individual strangers, the misters. And so it almost feels like they don't see humanity as actually being sentient entities that mm. matter, like th that humanity only exists as a resource for them. I do wonder, could Murdoch and Schreber have saved them by teaching them empathy? And he just didn't bother. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And I mean, it. you know, by, by the time that the actual confrontation has occurred, by the time that the good guys and the bad guys fully understand each other, at that point, things are so apocalyptic that I don't know if there really would have been time. Mm. But maybe. And that's something that is interesting in the movie. Like, the movie's general thesis seems to be that the soul exists, or at least there's a part of us independent of our memories and our experiences that makes us who we are. And I, I don't know if I agree with you know that premise or, or or not i generally come down on the side of of skepticism toward it but that does appear to be the movie's perspective and if you go with that perspective it almost seems like that's something that's lacking in the strangers in their true alien possible hive mind nature hmm. that they're incapable of that individuality like we we find that after mr hand gets imprinted with john's identity that like sheer concentrated individuality starts killing him so if you look at it that way it almost seems like it would have been impossible that the strangers and humanity are fundamentally incompatible, which is is sad, certainly. Well, let's talk a little bit about that theme of the soul. It, one of the things that's really interesting about Dark City as well is that it, like, I was looking for a very precise metaphor in the movie, and it's not there. Like, the movie lives entirely in the abstract. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't try to like, and this is a metaphor for what's going on in this country or that. Like, it's not. It's entirely cerebral. It's entirely abstract. It lives in philosophy, and the movie doesn't really build a thesis for its conclusion. It just kind of takes it for granted and then just shows you the outcome. Like, it, mm-hmm. it it doesn't prove to you that humanity has a soul. It just takes it for granted that it does. I like the theme that it implies more than the theme that it almost states. For me, this is a very existential movie or existentialist, I should say. Like, we see at the end that John Murdoch is in control of the machines that alter the reality of the city. And he could do, theoretically, anything. But what he chooses to do is he chooses to basically leave the city mostly as it is, because all the people living in it, you know, as far as they know, they're just a street sweeper, or a singer, or a hotel clerk, or whatever. Those are the only memories they have. And rather than stripping that away, than stripping away the lie... And starting something fresh, he just tweaks it. He figures, okay, well, if this is what people have, let's find meaning in this subjective reality because it's the only reality that is available. Rather than, you know, creating this traumatic recreation of the entire world, you know, it's right there in the last line. His wife, who's now been rewritten and doesn't remember him, asks his name, and he just says, after thinking about it for a sec, John Murdoch. He just chooses to adopt and improve the subjective reality that is all he has. And I find that kind of beautiful. The idea that, you know, even if the origins of something are flawed, even if we'll never fully understand where we came from or who we're supposed to be, that we can just decide. Like, Mm. I, I just love that so much, and I think the movie conveys it so well. Whether or not that was the intent of the writers and the director, I don't know, but that's the take that I really enjoy in it. I think it might have been intentional because the color schemes and the visual language all point towards that, where throughout the movie, most of Dark City is black and green. And the strangers, when you get to their lair, it's always blue and just blue. And when John Murdoch starts his revolution, per se, and starts to own his power, yellow starts popping out, like in huge doses. You realize, oh, wait green is you know yellow and blue together Mm -hmm. so what we've been seeing is the merging of those two forces and then when he recreates shell beach at the end which is really i get teary-eyed at that like the darkness is so oppressive in dark city that when the light comes it really gives that effect that sense of elation oh yeah and you get essentially the equipment like they don't actually show a rainbow because they're not that corny but like you get all the colors all of a sudden and it's it's a sense that the blue is in there like the sky is blue and it's part of their legacy that fake nurture is part of their legacy now that is an excellent analysis i had never thought about that but i i love that and i I think you're totally right and and that totally works the idea that like what the strangers did was coming from a place of, of selfishness and possibly evil but it's still part of this grand fabric of what existence is. And to ignore that, to remove it, would be to ignore and to remove a part of of life and of ourselves. Having thought of that, because I love to nitpick, I do wonder when he creates Shell Beach, how it is that Jennifer Connelly, his wife, gets there before he does. Because he was right next to the door. You know, when I was rewatching this with my fiance Anna, she asked the exact same question. figuring, wait, no, this woman just got on a bus directly to Shell Beach, and now she got to this place that's kind of near Shell Beach, but before John, even though he was there, and yeah, I just choose to assume at that point the movie's pure metaphor and we go with it, but yeah, it's certainly an inconsistency. (laughs) Well, speaking of inconsistencies, and I'm doing that mostly because I love the movie, this is not heckling, it's just I'm amused by these things, but the biggest set piece in the movie for me, and the thing that was just kind of like, wow, it's the trailer moment, if you will, is the first time that the strangers start to change the city and move things around. I'm always amused by one little detail. It's the chandelier. So they come into this working class apartment with chandeliers and clothes, and then the table starts elongating and a feast appears and it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. It's a great set piece. And then they put the chandelier down and I'm like, you you couldn't create the chandelier? Like that's where you drew the line? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it is interesting the way that like so much of what the strangers do to alter reality, their tuning, is just this telekinetic magic, essentially. And then the parts that are just more manual and more delicate. And I don't know, for me, I kind of like that we can't understand it, that mm. just this process of tuning, how it works is ambiguous and alien. 
for me, I don't know, if I had to, to no-prize it, to use a Marvel term, I would think that the parts that they have to do manually are the parts that they're just doing by rote rather than being able to um, comprehend like the physics of something. Mm-hmm. But that, I don't know. I, I, I think it just looks cool and maybe that's all there is to it. Yeah, I, I think you're right that it is about making their technology alien. Like it, it doesn't entirely make sense by, you know, our understanding of how things would work if we had that technology. I think throughout the entire movie, there's a mix of old traditional effects, like there's quite a bit of wire work in there mixed with the CGI. Alex Proyas really made a movie that is anachronistic in every sense, like even his use of special effects is anachronistic. And I think that's probably part of that. Like he's like, you have to dress them up, but we're going to change buildings. And it's, it's just like, it never quite entirely makes sense. And that's part of what leaves Dark City a, a movie that is alienating in all the right ways, you know? Exactly, yeah. Like, we're always a little bit outside of the logic of, of what's going on. Like, in in some ways, the same way that the protagonist is, but in other ways, like, it's another world. It's a world that's not ours, and so the fact that we don't feel like we can quite grasp its nature, I think, is, is appropriate and engrossing. I want to talk a little bit about the ending as we're approaching the end of the podcast. One of the criticisms I've heard pointed out that the final battle is kind of super late. And for me, well, A, that's true. But for me, it's because that's not the point, like to a certain degree. Like it feels a little bit like all the explosions in their fight in the climatic battle uh, with, I think it's Mr. Book at that point. Uh, Yes, Mr. Book. Where they're just kind of like passing around a knife of all things, like everything's exploding and they're just like passing around a knife. (laughs) First of all, symbolically, it's nice because a knife is like, like, especially it's a dagger. It's, It's not a kitchen knife or anything. It has only one use and it's violence. It's the only thing it's used for. And so for them to pass it around, I think there's a certain level of symbolism there. I'm not sure what it represents, but it looks like symbolism to me. (laughs) But I I think it's kind of almost playing to the trope for the sake of the trope. It's just like it's giving you that sense of catharsis that an action scene gives you because the catharsis is important to the story, but the violence is not, the action is not, because that's not the point. I don't know. I'm, I'm inclined to look at the big telekinetic yelling battle a little more charitably, I think, just simply because superhero comics are Mm. my media home and so in that regard it fits right in you know i agree it's not really of a tone with the rest of the movie to see like all the strangers getting blown away left and right to see things exploding and you know if the movie ended right after that i think it would retroactively kind of wreck a lot of what it's going for but at the same time it's kind of cool i recognize that everybody's going to agree with me on that but i will always give that a pass in media i think you know, fair enough. It does the job, is the thing about it. You need a sense of catharsis. You need something big and showy to say, this is all or nothing. This matters, and we're heading towards the end of the conflict. And it sets you up for what really is the final confrontation, which is his two, three line conversation at the end with Mr. Hand. Where it's like, you try to look for humanity here, and he points to his head, and then, but it's really here, and he points to his heart. I remember as, as a 20-year-old hating that line and re-watching it today, kind of liking it. Agreed, yeah. It's one of those things where, like, you know, we were talking about sort of the meaning of the movie, whether it's about the soul or it's about existentialism or, or whatever. And for me, like, whether John's right or not doesn't really matter because he's made his decision to be confident in the direction that he's going. And so, yeah, with that, I think the emotional catharsis there. I would agree that, that that's sort of like our, our actual final conflict. The fact that we do get that careful, deliberate denouement and just that beautiful set of final shots that kind of wraps everything up. I like that that's what we're left with. Mm. I'm so grateful that his final confrontation with the strangers is a polite conversation. Exactly, yeah. I mean, because I think part of it is at that point he is confident enough in his power and his identity that he doesn't need to rebel against anything. And part of it also is just he's showing that he's not the serial killer that they tried to build him to be, that he is a person with compassion. Mm. He knows he can't save Mr. Hand, and I don't know that he would regardless, but he at least doesn't need to make things worse because that's not who he is. So any final words on Dark City? Man, I feel like I could talk about this movie forever. 
I just really enjoy that it's a movie that knows exactly what it wants to do and does it. There are some Hollywood conventions, like that big battle at the end, but by and large, Dark City doesn't really feel like any other movie. In terms of pacing, in terms of aesthetics, and I appreciate that about it. I appreciate that in 1998, you know, just shortly before The Matrix would define dark alternate reality whatever movies for decades we have this one weird little oddity that we can just come back to and that totally holds up like if anyone's listened to this whole episode and still hasn't seen it somehow first of all we're very sorry for spoiling all the mysteries but second of all it's worth seeing like in 2021 i enjoyed it maybe even more than i did in 1998 i don't know if the same is true for you dimitri i loved the movie when it came out but re-watching it it hasn't lost any of its luster in the sense that like this movie is timeless in, in the way it's constructed it doesn't age and you're watching this thing remembering that you watched this 20 years ago and it's you're having essentially the same experience because mm-hmm. it's constructed in such a timeless way yeah, I, I recommend it. I especially recommend it to younger listeners. Like if you're in your late teens, early twenties, I think it's an age where you're going to be more attracted to tackling issues at an abstract level, and I think that movie is gonna hit the spot. Completely agree. Yeah, timeless is absolutely the word, and uh, in terms of what it can offer the viewer as well as in terms of you know its its aesthetics and its techniques, I think you you hit the nail on the head. All right, then. So, actually, I was meaning to ask you, are you guys on lockdown in your state? Because I know it's different from state to state. So I'm in Oregon, and we are on partial lockdown. Currently, there are pretty severe limitations on gatherings and what businesses are and are not allowed to do. We're um, just about the most locked down that uh, we've been right now, which, you know, obviously, hey, we do what we need to by all means. But um, yeah, certainly hoping that as uh, as vaccination continues, things will be able to safely and, and wisely open up a bit. Uh, absolutely. It's, look, it's for everybody. I'm in Canada, in my province in particular, we have the most severe uh, lockdown. We have a curfew. Oh, wow. And we've been at it for a year. We're all exhausted. But this is the final leg. We do this right. We don't have to do it again. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we're we're all about as burned out as we can be. But I would love to be able to look back a year from now and be like, you know, maybe not everyone in the world handled things well, but at least we did what we needed to do to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And speaking of that, so given those lockdowns, I have a lot of friends who have sent me messages recently, especially parents, asking me if I had any suggestions to help their family pass the time and find activities for their kids so that it's not just this depressing (laughs) trudge, but an event. And I had this idea just today. I thought I would launch on this podcast. If you're looking for something to do with your family, every episode I'm gonna end with a little challenge for you guys to do. So today we talked about Dark City and there's a beautiful film noir aesthetic to it. And so I'm going to challenge any listener who's interested in doing this. If you would recreate your favorite film noir scene in your home, and because the strangers are afraid of water, in your bathroom. <laughs> I love it. So if you send us a picture of this at uh, mail at idiomanic.com or you post it on our Facebook page, I'll collect all of these. I'll put it on the page of the next podcast episodes. And so we'll get to share all that and have that as a fun activity for all of us. Uh, you're coming back for the next episode, aren't you, Miles? Yes, I am. Very excited about that. And we'll be discussing a movie that is near and dear to me, The Wind Rises by director Hayao Miyazaki. Yes, I love Miyazaki's movies so much. I'm really excited to talk about this one. And so, listeners, if you're interested in that, if you haven't seen it, go check it out and join us in the next episode. We can talk about it. And uh, in the meantime, Miles, where can people find you on the web? Uh, well, I do a podcast called Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, which has been going for, oh, God, almost seven years. How'd that happen? And so if you want to hear about the ins, outs, and retcons of comics' greatest superhero soap opera, then Jay Edidin and I have many, many episodes to tell you exactly about that. So you can find us at explainthexmen.com or at explainthexmen, no E at the beginning, just explainthexmen on Twitter. That's great. And you can find my work at uh, idiomanic.com. And I am not on social media. (laughs) So, tough. Not the worst decision at all.
Oh, hi there. You listened to the end. I wasn't sure you would, but if you like what you heard, consider subscribing to the channel. Click on the like button. And perhaps someone in the comments could give me directions to Shell Beach. I am lost.